Hello, everybody. Very good to see you all. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force, and I'm extremely pleased to be hosting this event today called The Case for Radical Reform of the Audit Profession. Uh, we think this topic is pretty central to the whole idea of changing the way that the world of commerce works. Why? Because the world of commerce um, operates within a framework of governance, be that good governance or weak, poor governance. And the reality is that the audit profession has a huge bearing on how that is done. Uh, and that's why we believe this particular event is quite important. In roughly 15, 16, 17 minutes or so, we're going to go to our first live speaker, Christiana. Hello. Um, hi, Christiana. Lovely to have you with us. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers tonight. We've got Christiana Hultz. We have uh, Lord Prem Seeker and Mark Bishop. But first of all, we're going to go to a video recording of a session that was prepared earlier today with one of our ambassadors, uh, Dr. Shan Turnbull, who operates out of Sydney. And given the choice of either doing a quick uh, video interview with me or getting up at 3 a.m., you can guess which one he chose. So let me now play this video recording. I'll tell you in advance, I think Shan gets pretty much to the heart of the matter in this short video that lasts about 15, 16, 17 minutes or so. He really does dive straight into the issue around, um, around radical need for reform of the system. So I do hope you enjoy it. Shan, thank you very much indeed for taking some time out to be with us today and to record this short session with me so that we can play on our event later tonight all about the case for radical reform of the audit profession. Shan, if I can invite you to briefly kick off by introducing yourself and talking about your background, and then we'll go to the few slides that you've prepared for this session after that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy. It's been great to catch up with you again. Um, my life has been that of a, a serial entrepreneur setting up new companies. And uh, I've set up three companies that were later publicly traded. I also became a member of a private equity group and we, uh, we took over eight publicly traded companies and reorganized them. That meant we walked into boardrooms uninvited and if you didn't find uh, misbehavior, malfeasance and problems, it meant that you weren't looking. And this inspired me that if you drive a car on a public road, you need to know the rules of the road. And if you, if you drive a publicly listed company, you ought to know the rules. And so I had a letter published in our national newspaper in 1971 that uh, there ought to be an education course for company directors. And that, having, that talked me into it. And in 1975, we launched the very first educational course for company directors in the world. And it got... Uh, the street became a national taught through 14 universities and exported. Uh, but my part of the course as a founding uh, author got taken out. It was about how you um, got rid of the systemic conflicts of interest. And as a serial entrepreneur, you wanted to keep your reputation. So when I was setting up new companies, I would set up a watchdog board to keep an eye on me. And and that's what I want to talk about, uh, about the audit problem, because the audit problem is systemic. Um, auditors aren't really independent. The narrow definitions of independence of the audit board, accounting standards board allows them to call themselves independent, but they, in truth, they're not independent at all. And their job is, they're like a judge in a court of law. They are appointed to judge the accountability of directors and they report to the shareholders. And we'll see later that in, in this presentation that the 1990 Caparo case, judged by the UK law lords, said the purpose of the audit is to provide intelligence to the members of the company, that's the shareholders, uh, on hiring the directors, firing them and paying them. So it, they are a judge and they have got a systemic conflict, unconscionable conflict of interest. And saying that they're independent is a lie. And it's an embarrassment both to directors and to the auditors that, they've, that this is a legal conflict, which it's made legal by the corporate constitution. 
and you can solve it by changing corporate constitution. So I don't see the need to reform the audit profession so much as to reform corporate constitutions to solve two problems, the systemic conflict of auditors and also the systemic problem of company directors in a single board, which the English are committed to. And if you've got a single board, those directors have absolute power to identify and manage their own conflict of interest. And so they have absolute power to corrupt themselves, the business, the auditors, the regulators, society, and poison the culture of their host nation. The solution is very simple. You change the corporate constitution like I've done on two occasions as a serial entrepreneur, and you have the, the shareholders elect two boards. They elect one board to manage the business like they do now, and they appoint a second board, which is a governance board. And it takes over the role which directors now have in their audit committees, nomination committees, remuneration committees. So it takes over all those activities which directors have a conflict of interest and they pretend it's not there. And it's just amazing that uh, ethical people and ethical experts ne never see this elephant in the room. And you have people saying, oh, this is good corporate governance. It's not. It's toxic governance. It's forcing good people to do bad things. And uh, the solution is very simple. Change your corporate constitution and eliminate the conflicts. And you simplify the work of both. And you don't get an, an uh, uh, bias uh, of the auditors. So it solves two problems. Let's we go to the next overhead. It's there, thank you. Oh, and uh, yeah. as I said, I've walked the talk twice, setting up these watchdog boards, and they're elected differently to the management board. It's the old fashioned idea of one vote per shareholder. So if you, even there's an, a major shareholder, he doesn't control the governance board. It's the little people, the little the individuals that control the governance board. They don't interfere with management in any way. And I don't know if any commercial reason why directors should have both the power to manage and the power to govern. Um, now, in Australia, we had a, a, a senator uh, of a minority party, and he wanted to he wanted to introduce legislation for all Australian companies to adopt one of these uh, watchdog board, and he gave it a much better name. I called it a corporate senate, and he called it a governance board, and he wanted to make it a condition for the privatisation of our government-owned uh, telephone company, and the government would have ended up as a major shareholder. And then you get the dictatorship of the majority and fraud on the minority. So the, the different voting ways is a, of checks and balances, which you don't have in publicly listed companies now. There's no checks and balances. Let's go on to the next slide. And as a result, um, good people can do bad things. An exemplar of that is Sir Adrian Cadbury, uh, who's a very good, intelligent, highly uh, respected person. Uh, but he has poisoned corporate governance uh, codes around the world, including Australia. And here's a picture of him, ironically, um, giving me an award for a paper I'd written about network governance. And network governance, as the name suggests, introduces a separation of powers, and it cures the, po the toxic poison of conflicts of interest by the shareholders forming the audit committee instead of the directors. And if we go on to the next overhead, we'll see how Sir Adrian got it wrong. The UK Cummies Act of 1862 made non-binding provisions for corporate constitutions to elect an audit committee of shareholders, not directors. Another reason is that audit committees emerged in the USA in the 1920s before stock exchanges required balance sheets or before the SEC was created. And the purpose was to protect directors. The audit committees weren't created to protect shareholders or investors. It was to protect directors 
from their management uh, who might have misused the funds for which they had personally guaranteed. So there's a red hot motive for them to keep an eye on management, nothing to do with shareholder or investor protection. Uh, by mis the third problem was that by mistake, US audits followed the 1929 UK prospectus provisions of an auditor reporting to directors. That happens in England. The UK annual auditor, however, reports only to shareholders, not to the directors. And the reason is set out, the other neglecting point, was that the UK law lords in the Caparo case, only two years before the Cadbury Committee, uh, said that the purpose of an audit was to provide intelligence to the members of the company, that is the shareholders, uh, for, for making the only decisions they can make at an annual general meeting, and that is to hire and fire and remunerate the directors. In other words, it's a governance audit, not an investor audit. Next slide. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Shan. So, so what you're basically saying, if I put this into my plain English, you're saying that at the very, very heart, at the very epicenter of corporate governance is a fundamental flaw. And this fundamental flaw is that there needs to be audit, there needs to be governance, but the only way for that audience and governance to be effective is if the people controlling that audit process are the shareholders, not the directors. Otherwise, effectively, the directors are marking their own homework. In putting it in plain English, that's the fundamental yes, issue. You've got it. It's simple. And the, the ethics experts are ethically blind by not seeing it. They would say, oh, they're independent. It must be OK. We have independence of mind or we're a separate company or we don't own shares. And that's nonsense. You look at the power relationships and the directors have power over the auditors uh, of, who, uh, of their appointment and pay and, and, and managing them. So what, so what you're saying is even if there was a genuine attempt to create fair, balanced, objective governance, if the structure of that governance is that the directors are in charge of that governance process, then inevitably over a period of time, there will be, there'll be forces at work that will cause incentives to come into play and bias to come into play and eventually that governance process will likely fail because of that power imbalance the people who have the power also have the power to cover up what's going on etc cetera, etc cetera. And, exactly and that's and, why you have systemic failure thank you very and much nobody wants to admit it because it means that what they call good governance is toxic governance which even we, the eth yes which takes me to this final question shan so you mentioned the course that was established in Australia that then went mm. overseas. Why mm. is it that your bit got taken out of the course, do you think? Oh, inconvenient truth. Uh, because direct, because it, had, it had reduced the power of directors. And, the, you know, they want the power. And they say, oh, we can't manage the, uh, the corporation if we don't have all those powers. Well, uh, uh, in some cultures uh, in Europe, and uh, no director... Uh, would take on the role of chairing an annual general meeting of uh, of the shareholders because the purpose of an annual general meeting is to make the directors accountable. And if you control the process of being held accountable, you've got an intrinsic conflict of interest. You know, it just means that the whole uh, national culture of ethics is poisoned because you say, oh, everybody, all those big public company wallets do it. You know, let's all do it. Let's not recognize the conflict of interest. Oh, let's call it independent. When there is a conflict, just say, oh, it's really, um, they're independent uh, people. So they, it's not a conflict. It's, it's the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to, to see or meet. Even the, most, even the most leading ethics experts, and that's why ethics experts fail, because they can't admit to seeing the elephant in the room, which is the corporate constitution, because no, there's no education course that I know that teaches how to design ethical corporate constitutions. They're designed by lawyers who are paid by the directors who want the maximum power and freedom and options. Shan, thank you very much. In, in summary, your message is there's a fundamental flaw in corporate governance. Because that fundamental flaw is there, there will always be corporates misbehaving. We'll always have scandals. We'll always have things going on that we as society as a whole 
really don't want to happen. And tinkering at the edges is not going to do it. We need fundamental exactly. reform at the centre. If you look at the stakeholder controlled organisations in England, like the John Lewis Partnership, um, you have bottom up governance, which is not taught at any university. And, and, they, and they've existed for half a century without those sort of conflicts or problems. And, the, you know, that shows you how you can get success, reliable and resilient success. Shan Turnbull, all the way in Sydney. I'm very pleased that you've taken time out to record this short session with me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. What I will do, however, is quickly share my screen to talk about something quite important within the Transparency Task Force community, and that is the groups that we run. So we run uh, quite a few uh, groups within the Transparency Task Force, and there is one particular group that you may not yet be aware of that we operate. And it's our group all about governance, uh, culture and conduct. So that's obviously the one I'm going to draw attention to. There are 25 groups within the Transparency Task Force in total. Uh, the one that we have on governance, culture and conduct is we believe remarkably important. Um, governance and culture pretty much determines the conduct within organisations and what we're trying to do in our little world is to try to influence the way that things are done. And sometimes we do that simply by making sure that um, a light, a bright light is shone on the things that are going wrong. So when thinking about today's events, when thinking about who we should have speaking and what we should be talking about, I uh, am particularly pleased that we've got Christiana and Lord Seeker and Mark Bishop speaking and of course, you'll be able to watch the correct version of the Dr. Shan Turnbull video later. But let me just briefly mention the essence of what Shan Turnbull was talking about earlier on this afternoon. He's basically saying that there is a fundamental conflict of interest within most organizations. He argues that there is a big difference between um, a board whose purpose is to manage the successful commercial life of the organization and a board whose purpose is to govern that organization and take care of things such as remuneration and conflicts of interest and other multi-stakeholder issues such as ESG. And Shan basically argues this. He argues that it is simply unrealistic, risky and naive to expect boards of directors of companies to obey those two masters concurrently. It's unrealistic to, on one hand, be thinking, what can we do to drive maximum profit, maximum share price, particularly in the short term in some companies? What can we do to do all those things? And what do we need to do <clears throat> to actually keep the organization out of trouble and make sure that it uh, operates within the correct rules? So Shan's argument is very simply this. Most organizations need to have two separate boards and both of those boards need to be controlled by the shareholders. And he's got a particular issue around the way that directors of companies tend to dominate AGMs and tend to dominate organizational policy. His view is that the Cadbury reforms took us all down the wrong route. They took us in the wrong direction. They created the opportunity for people to run organizations and to do so in a manner that can simply be contextualized as operating within a massive conflict of interest. If the directors control the board, control the AGM, control everything else, then they will end up overusing the power that they have and there are no natural checks and balances in place to uh, to deal with that so that's essentially the message that uh, shan portrays in the video that you'll have a chance to watch uh, tomorrow if you'd like to so what we're going to do now is to go to christiana i had the pleasure of meeting christiana at a governance event on zoom that was held a few months ago very very impressed by what christiana has to say Christiana, please over to you to introduce yourself and dive into your thoughts about the question, how can we drive radical reform into the audit profession? Christiana, over to you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Andy. Um, indeed, uh, we met a couple of months ago and uh, not only you were impressed with what I was saying, I was clearly impressed with what you were talking about, your thoughts about good governance and uh, good ideas, uh, the way forward to improve um, the, uh, the, the governance within uh, firms, within companies. Um, so I very happily accepted to speak today at your uh, TTF event. My name is Christiane Hölz. I'm a lawyer at DSW. DSW is um, the largest German investor association. We are um, helping our members in um, attending general meetings as exercising their voting rights, for example. But we also are very strong on the corporate governance side as such. We're a member of the Corporate Governance Commission, my colleague is. And uh, so we have a steep interest as shareholder uh, representatives, of course, in uh, companies performing well on the one side, but also performing within good governance um, uh, conduct of business and um, we, when we met uh, Andy and myself, um, I uh, spoke about um, I spoke about uh, uh, good governance and I took the example of Wirecard. Um, you all will know what happened at Wirecard. It's the largest case of fraud that happened uh, over the last uh, years. And it has clearly illustrated what can happen if the three lines of defense, the internal control system, the good governance, and including a strong supervisory board, of course, and the external audit fail to perform. And listening to your conclusion, Andy, of what Shan uh, has, uh, uh, was uh, supposed to speak about, um, I, can, uh, I can say yes, two-tier board like we have in Germany is, uh, is indeed really helpful because we have a supervisory board that is composed of uh, employee representatives and shareholder representatives. Um, uh, but even then, then, in the case of Wirecard, even this line of defense has failed. The third line of defense is the auditor. Um, and also this line significantly failed to perform uh, at Wirecard. And if you look at the amount of money, 20 billion euro lost for investors, this is really a major issue. And um, this is why I thought uh, it is worth looking a bit more in detail into um, what we need to do to improve the audit profession because it was not the auditor detecting the fraud at Wirecard. It was journalists from the FT pointing to allegations of fraud already in 2015. And um, I would not speak about an audit reform, a need for an audit reform. Uh, if there was only Wirecard, all of the big four firms, and as well as the, next, uh, the firms the next year down, have been rocked by scandals. Uh, the oversight body for auditors in the US found significant high failure rates. So I give you the most recent figures available. Inspectors found Deloitte and EY got one in five audits wrong. PricewaterhouseCoopers, almost one in four. And KPMG got, um, uh, got even every second audit wrong. And all four firms had worse records uh, than in their latest spot checks. Uh, 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 that the audit, uh, the the audit oversight body did uh, before in earlier years since 2004, or it's very easy. Check accounting scandals uh, at Wikipedia. All of the big four accounting firms had been auditing companies involved in accounting scandals over the last 10 years. So, in theory. Statutory auditors are there to identify and assess risk from material misstatements and financial statements, and they have to publicly report on their findings. They are entrusted with a public interest task, and especially shareholders rely on their reports. So this means that if we cannot be sure that auditors are doing their job properly and that shareholders can rely on their signature, we do have a significant problem. So, and then the question is, of course, what needs to be done to reduce the incidence of audit failures? So let's uh, look up to, um, at the status quo in the EU first. We had a big audit reform already after the financial crisis. The aim was improve statutory audits, reinforce auditors' independence and their professional skepticism. So what the EU did was a prohibition of certain non-audit services, introducing a mandatory external rotation and extending the reporting obligations. 
So, and now we look at the results of the reforms uh, of the reform two years after. And at the beginning of this year, uh, the EU has um, issued has or has published a monitoring report on the EU audit market for public interest entities. And this reveals some interesting findings. You can find it on the EU website, so it's easily accessible for everyone. So since the audit reform, we have 10% less auditors, we have 35% less audit firms auditing public interest entities, and we have a 9% increase in audit firms turnover on statutory audits. But big four still dominate the audit market. 66% of public interest um, entity statutory audit market is still done by the big four before it was some, some before the audit reform was somewhere at 80%, I think. But the worst thing is to me that uh, the national supervisors highlighted deficiencies in audit firms' internal quality control systems. So they found problems with internal quality control systems, lack of inappropriate mon uh, appropriate monitoring of high risk audited entities, and insufficient audit evidence and documentation. So what are the reasons for this lack in quality? One say it's the oligopoly of the big four which hinders competition. Maybe it's the lack of independence of audios, lack of liability, lack of supervision. The EU and regulators as such tried a lot to break up the oligopoly of the big four that have been hit by scandals, but so far the measures failed. So whereas what is the way forward? And I think we need to improve the audit profession in four areas. We need to improve the quality of the auditor's work. We need to enhance auditor's competition. We need to improve auditor's independence and we need to improve auditor's liability. These are the four areas I would like to speak about in the next couple of minutes. So let's start with the quality of the auditor's work. The first element that guarantees that an auditor can properly exercise his role is access to necessary information. A lack of information easily becomes a lack of control. That's very obvious. And in the Wirecard case, we, had, we saw that auditors encountered issues in getting required information and data, including from third parties. So in order to help the auditors here to fully exercise their mission, the auditor's right to information, in particular from employees, uh, needs to be fostered and confidentiality agreements need to be adapted. If we move to auditor's competition, I think what is necessary, We, I said that the EU has introduced a mandatory external auditor rotation, but that is not enough. We need to add a cooling off period to the internal and the external audit rotation requirement, because it doesn't make any sense for a mandatory audit rotation and then allowing firms to rejoin the company uh, after one or two years. This is part of good governance for former executives, and it should be introduced for audit firms as well. Another idea, it's already existing in certain member states like France or Bulgaria, is the requirement of a joint audit. This could have several advantages, right? in particular, if you have the Wirecard scandal uh, in your mind. Two audit firms have to agree on the audit work and its conclusions. It's more difficult for the company management or the board to influence two audit firms than one. The liability of wrongdoing is split into two. That would also improve uh, the situation of, put, uh, of the victims. In my view, it, uh, however, has also disadvantages, this uh, joint audit. On the one hand, and I'm speaking, of course, as a shareholder representative, uh, there is an increase in cost for companies and thereby for shareholders. In addition, joint audits do not necessarily break up the oligopoly of the big four. Currently, only those seem to be capable to perform a full audit for a company like, for example, Deutsche Bank or E.ON or another large cap. So no wonder Deutsche Bank, for example, they had KPMG auditing them for more than 100 years. Of course, they could not find another one, they say. I therefore favor the idea of a shared audit where a second auditor is appointed to conduct certain parts of the audit services and then uh, he may challenge the lead auditor on specific parts of the audit with his or her expertise. And this, in my view, would help smaller audit firms to enter the market and would still enable a four eyes view on certain sensitive parts of the business. Let's move to the auditor's independence. And this, for me, is the most crucial part of the game. You will well remember I give you a 
very personal example now um, for for me as a um, representative of BSW. That's uh, that's the Volkswagen case, the diesel scandal. You will all remember that took place a couple of years ago. It has less to do with wrong accounting, but Volkswagen, in the aftermath of the scandal, had restricted the information flow to shareholders severely. They would not disclose uh, the results of an internal investigation they performed, um, and they would not give shareholders the full picture. Shareholders who lost a lot of money and needed this information on who was responsible for the scandal uh, in order to get uh, compensated via courts. So we at DSW initiated a special audit, which is possible under German law to reveal such kind of information. We asked numerous, really numerous audit firms to perform this special audit for us. And the big four, of course, but many other uh, two uh, second layer uh, audit firms, the smaller audit firms came back to us and said, ah, we cannot, we are confused that we are performing services for Volkswagen, we cannot do the special audit for you. We finally found an, uh, a firm and the special audit was launched. It is still ongoing. Volkswagen is um, fighting strongly against us. But as you can see, if shareholders are not able to find an independent auditor to help them to exercise their rights, something is severely wrong in the market. So what can we do or what can we propose to increase auditors' independence? Firstly, and that is really important, is that auditors should be required to act exclusively as auditors. No non-audit services should be allowed. This is very puristic, a very puristic approach, but in my view, this destruction of non-audit services needs to be removed. And secondly, most importantly, in my view, is that we need to eliminate the major conflict of interest an auditor has. We need to propose fundamental changes in who pays for the audits. Currently, you will all know that, auditors are paid by the entity that needs to be audited, of course. And who pays the bill is the one who gets the results he wants. The fact that auditors' responsibility is to the shareholders of the aud uh, audited company, although the auditor is paid by um, the audited company, this creates a distortion in the system. And the, in my view, the audit role should be one of a statutory inspection, wherein the proposal for appointment, the remuneration, and the duration of the engagement would be in the responsibility of a third party, maybe a regulator or whomever, but not the company itself. The appointment itself should remain with the shareholders though, as owners of the company. Such a concept may be especially relevant for the audit of the financial statements of large companies. This matter definitely should be explored uh, in more detail. Um, the only problem we have is whether it is feasible. It's uh, a proposal that had been made in the legislation process, but I'm very hopeful that we will be able to bring this proposal up again. Let me turn to the auditor's liability, which definitely needs a reform too. Firstly, we need a European collective redress mechanism for shareholders. The EU has created such an instrument for consumers. They have uh, created such an instrument for indirect investors, so meaning for fund holders, holders of ETFs, but there's nothing like this for shareholders. And take uh, into account the Wirecard case again. This means that shareholders do not have any tool available against the only remaining party in the game, the auditor that would be able to compensate their losses resulting from their fraudulent behavior and non-detection by auditors. But even if they had, they would not have a chance to be compensated, at least not in Germany, because uh, Wirecard is insolvent, their directors do not have enough money, and the auditors in Germany guess what? They have a liability cap of 4 million euros. They had it. This has been raised to 60 million euros, very generous from the German government for cases of ordinary negligence. But this is, of course, still far from being enough, especially as the burden of proof, uh, of course, lies with the damaged shareholders and not with the auditor. So lifting the liability cap for auditing firms and introducing, uh, in addition, a personal liability for audit partners are therefore ideas that need to be explored. And last but not least, from my perspective, there is also a need for more accountability of auditors towards the shareholders. The auditors' reports today, they consist only of standardized phrases. 
the, these phrases are totally meaningless for investors. We have the key audit matters since the audit reform, which have improved the situation a bit. The auditor is uh, required to give some more information on certain important uh, auditing issues they performed during the year, but it's an improvement, but it's uh, not not um, the uh, the end of the uh, the end of the road. We have to go. So a further tool in, could be to strengthen the auditor's position by enabling him to explain himself at the general meeting and allow shareholders, and that is very important, question him on his work and um, the auditing of the financial statements. So let me conclude. There is a true lack of quality among audit services. We still see it. The audit reform was the first step in the EU, but it has not, uh, it has not fully fulfilled its aim. It has not yet delivered. And we therefore need stronger action to improve the audit competition, auditors' independence, and auditors' liability. And therefore, I'm totally thankful that um, Transparency Task Force uh, enabled me to give some ideas um, uh, to the public. And uh, I'm very happy to discuss with all of you. As I'm on holidays currently, I may, um, my uh, internet connection is not really stable, so apologies if it didn't work properly throughout uh, my speech and I will have to leave in uh, about half an hour, but up to then I will be there and ready to answer any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much indeed, Christiana. You get your message across very, very clearly, regardless of the quality of the internet connection you are you. Uh, using, and I think we all owe a big uh, vote of thanks for the presentation we just heard, not just because of its quality, but also because Christiana is doing this on a day off when she's on a holiday. Can we please show our appreciation? Christiana, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. If, if I may, Christiana, I'm going to put a question to you um, and then we'll open it up to everybody else so we can make this a nice conversation amongst ourselves. My question is this. Um, you have articulated for, you know, really key flaws in the current framework around audit the quality of the work isn't good enough there's a lack of competition there's a lack of true independence and the auditor's liability is unrealistically limited so these are four fundamental problems um, if i could use an analogy excuse me here um, it would be like a car manufacturer making a car where the engine didn't work very well at all and the brakes didn't function and the suspension was completely rubbish and it rusted within weeks and months rather than years and years and years. So we are talking about some fundamental flaws in the system. And yeah. clearly these flaws manifest in many kinds of ways, including of course, the many scandals that we're all very, very familiar with, Wirecard being one of them uh, over in Europe. And of course in the UK, we've had a long, long list of them. I'm sure that Lord Seeker will perhaps refer to one or two of those shortly. So here's my question. Given it's so obvious that the, in my analogy, the brakes are no good and the engine doesn't work and the car rust, et cetera, et cetera. Given how obvious that all is, why is it that here we are in 2021, you know, why is it all these years later that it hasn't already been sorted out or put in the question slightly differently who or what is pushing back on these obvious necessary reforms because that's where the problem is it's whatever is stopping the necessary reforms from happening that's where the real power play is taking place um what would you say to this this uh, question christiana the very blunt answer would be it's the um, audit lobby um that uh, hindered the uh, uh, very good audit reform. As I said, um, one idea of the commission was, for example, to, um, to introduce, um, uh, um, yeah, to, to uh, eliminate the, the um, major conflict of interest among auditors is that they are paid by the audit firms. Um, that uh, proposal was skipped very early in the process already. Um, but I think this is definitely 
uh, one one big issue. Uh, another thing, uh, on the other hand, is that I think the systems are really complex. Uh, systems of checks and balances are not easy. I think that the um, uh, the businesses of companies have um, have grown, have been uh, becoming even more global, more complex tax rules, um, you you name it. So um, I am. Um, I would not fully blame it on the reluctance of the auditors um, to to step uh, step on uh, and to uh, uh, to accept better um, better well, better governance. Um, I think uh, there are many more issues um, in in the game. Uh, but uh, yes, of course. Uh, therefore, we need. Um, definitely more competition among auditors. We need to get more auditing firms to be able to perform a full or partial audit of the large caps. Um, if you look at the auditing firms in the DAX 30, exclusive the uh, big four, there is no other, as to my knowledge so far, despite the audit reform. And um, they are, of course, they are changing between them and um, I think um, the audit, the, in, the, the internal rotation is, already, uh, is also very important. Um, however, the coziness between the auditor and the, the company um, has to be weighted against the knowledge uh, the audit firm gains when auditing a company a bit longer. So first year, second year of an audit, uh, of an audit firm auditing a new company is, um, is I think, uh, a very risky timing because it may also um, uh, happen that the auditor will not see certain things because he's not so deep in the business as an auditor has audited for um, a longer time. So, um, yeah, I think the, um, the problem is... Uh, uh, has several facets and uh, the audit lobby is one of them, but not the only. Uh, Christiana, thank you so much for such a, such a good answer. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Let's open things up a bit, folks. So if you'd like to make a point, please uh, wave something, preferably your hand or something at me so that I know you'd like to ask a question. Let's go to Sital Chima. Lovely to have you with us, Sital. So please spend a brief moment introducing yourself and then please put your point to Christiana. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sital Chima and I work as a sustainability investment consultant and I also um, have just written a chapter on sustainability and ESG for the Institute of Directors for board members of UK companies to understand sustainability more. Um, my question, Christiana, is that I agree with you completely, but that there are things changing in the UK. So firstly, um, the big four have finally agreed to something which is huge, which collective power of investors is huge. So the IIGCC, the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, has absolutely forced, their, um, forced the big four to do a complete U-turn. What they've done is 33 trillion pounds of investments that they have around 260 companies and countries, 16 countries. What they've done is that they've said that we're not accepting this anymore. We're not going to accept the big four just giving us the financial resilience of a company and telling us it's going to concern because it's financial performance is good enough. What we want going forward, and this happened in April 2021, just a couple of months ago, they're saying what we want, and they sent out a big letter, a huge report to every single of the top European companies, and they said what we want is for each company to be audited versus its climate resilience, its climate proofing. So we want to be assessing each company based on science-based targets, so on, carbon dioxide emissions, water resilience, uh, water usage, energy usage, and so on. So... The big four said, no, 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 we don't really understand this. All we do is financial reporting initially. And now all the big four have turned around in a big U-turn and have agreed that they have to do this because the investors are saying, well, sorry, you know, the, the accounts are the eyes and the ears of the people, of the, the investors, 
the uh, the board members and so on. And if you don't tell us what's going on, we can't invest in you. And so the big four have done a complete U-turn, which is great, to say from now on, we will do climate proofing. Mm. Number two, the other thing that's changing in the UK is AGA. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but it's, it's going to replace the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. It's only about financial, mm. financial. So the world is saying it's going to open up and AGA is going to be about the audit review and governance authority. So it's going to do ESG governance and financial. So it's the triple bottom, not just the people, not just profits, but people, profit, planet and so on. Just thought I would put that in and uh, ask Christiana, where where are you guys in terms of climate proofing and climate resilience in terms of being an ongoing sustainable concern in Europe, please? Thank you very much. I uh, excluded the uh, ESG part completely. I apology, uh, apologies for that. For that. Um, I should have uh, extended it because, um, in, uh, for example, I, I cannot speak a, uh, a, about the um, British market. We are, you know, since the Brexit, we're not looking that much anymore at Brits, I must, uh, I must confess. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so I'm not following. Uh, I have seen that uh, there is uh, there has been a consultation from the FCA uh, and uh, for an audit reform, but I haven't followed uh, up on this one. Um, but on on ESG, uh, you are fully right. Um, this is one of the means, from my perspective, that uh, could break up the audit market. Um, the cynical answer to your um, to the point you made that. The audit firms have um, finally agreed to also look in the non-financial statements and the sustainability uh, statements is that they know uh, that this is the biggest um, business they will have over the next year. So uh, if they would not go into this part, they would be stupid, of course, because uh, this is the part where you can earn money. But for me, uh, this is a real chance uh, for uh, for uh, an opening of uh, of the auditing market, because in this area, at least in Germany, we see a lot of companies that are smaller, but that are very much focused on ESG issues, especially on climate, um, climate topics uh, and things like that. And um, so far, the big four are a bit re re uh, reluctant to go into this market still, in at least in Germany, as far as I can see it. Uh, and there, uh, companies appoint uh, or shareholders that companies appoint these other uh, auditing firms, specialized audit firms. So maybe this is one means to uh, get new firms in the market. I have no problem if the big four will do it uh, themselves. They will do it uh, anyway. Um, but I would prefer to have the smaller ones uh, covering this part of what, what, a, what a helpful exchange of ideas there. Thank you very much, Christiana and Sital. I'm going to invite David Nickel, if he doesn't mind, to take himself off mute and just elaborate on the point you put in the chat, which I find very interesting. So David, why don't you in, introduce yourself and uh, talk to the point you put in the chat just now? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, really, I was just picking up on many of the points that, that, that the previous speaker has made and, and indeed much of the research that um, Lord Seeker has been uh, writing about for a significant amount of time and um, looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, really, I was just picking up that, um, I suppose from, from, from many people at the end of the day, audit now really generates very little, if any value. And the accounting bodies and the accounting firms will all tell us, oh, it gives X, Y, Z value. Yet at the end of the day, we've still got failure upon failure upon failure upon failure for well i mean the the accounting profession in its current form has been going for whatever 100 150 years however long and yet still fails to get the fundamental principles right um and and i say i mean i, I speak as as an accountant myself i don't actually do audits um partly because I don't have clients that are big enough to need them, but, but equally, I don't think they actually generate any value. What we're doing is spending a huge amount of money for reports that don't actually say anything to the, to the, to the users, that don't deliver any value because when things go wrong, 
the accountants just turn around and say, ah, oh, but our report is only to a limited group of people. And therefore, you, the investors who are actually affected by this, don't count. You're irrelevant as far as we're concerned. And so, you know, really, that's where my, my point is coming from, that these companies are spending huge amounts of money and huge amounts of resource into a process that's not delivering the shareholders any value, that's not delivering the companies any significant value because it's not finding the frauds. And when you think, I mean, in the earlier discussion, we had uh, people pointing out that the, uh, the, the only major accounting firm in recent history that's gone to the wall was Arthur Anderson on the back of the Enron scandal. Yeah. Um, when you have the Wirecard scandal happening and the auditors concerned have not gone to the wall, it's quite yeah. frankly to me as a semi-educated user, quite frankly, absolutely shocking. I mean, they failed on the most basic, you know, audit um, requirements. I mean, when I first was doing audit training, the first thing you do is look for evidence. Two billion euros of cash and they had no evidence for its existence. And the firms are still in existence. Mm. That makes me angry as hell, to be quite honest. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. I think you brought your point in the chapter life superbly. David, thank you very much. Let's go to anybody else that would like to make a point at this stage. So just if everyone's good, we'll swiftly move on. It looks like we're going to swiftly move on. Of course, what we're going to do once again is thank Christiana very much indeed for her session, especially as it's happening during your time off. That was great, Christiana. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for having me here. I will, uh, ex uh, I will leave the session now and I thank you all very much uh, for inviting me. You're thank most you. Welcome. Good luck thank for you. the rest of your session. Bye-bye. You. Bye-bye. Enjoy your holiday. Thank you, Christiana. Thank you. Bye-bye, Andy. Bye. Bye-bye. We're now going to go to our second speaker, Lord Prem Seeker. Uh, Prem is known to many of you. He's a real favourite within the TTF community for very good reason. He speaks truth to power without flinching ever. And I really admire that. And of course, he's got remarkable insights and experience in relation to this particular topic. Um, got to be world class as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Prem, over to you, sir, to pick it up from here and to share with us your thoughts about the case for radical reform of the audit profession. Thanks, Prem. Thank you. Well, thanks, Andy. And uh, good evening, everyone. And I really enjoyed uh, Christiana's uh, presentation. I could identify with a lot of things that, that she said as well. But there is a problem. There's always a problem. The problem is uh, Christiana and many others are seeking solutions within the current failed paradigm. So if you like, we have audits within many walks of life. Uh, we have uh, audits of our VAT returns, income tax returns. We have audits of our train tickets at airports. Our passports are audited in no case. None of these cases, the auditor ever appoints the auditor, ever remunerates the auditor, or can actually hire the auditor to enable the auditor to circumvent the rules. Neither does the auditor make the rules and regulations within which he or she works. These fundamental basics are all violated when you come to the external audit market. Uh, companies appoint their auditors, they remunerate them, the audit market is unlike any other market, like whether it is for telephones or uh, 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 whether it is for telephones or laptops. I'm sitting in front of a laptop now. It is a market created by the state. Now, if the state, if the, if the function of the state is to advance the welfare of the citizens, then the audit should be concerned with the welfare of all the stakeholders. On the other hand, if the state is captured and is a creature of the finance capital, then it should only be concerned about the welfare of shareholders. Now, the, uh, so all kinds of games are being played here. People say auditors serve the public interest. Which public? Which interest? I haven't seen uh, any, any of that in my life. Uh, for example, I was uh, advisor to the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee for its investigation of the audit failures at BHS and Carillion, there was not one iota of evidence. 
that the auditors were concerned with the welfare of employees, supply chain creditors, pension scheme, taxpayers or local councils or anybody. Their main aim was simply to serve their paymasters. So much so that the BHS auditor, who was PricewaterhouseCooper, a partner, without even being asked, backdated the audit report uh, to, to please uh, the paymasters. There's no information about the conduct of the audit available anywhere. That was one of the things Christiana did not mention. So auditors are appointed at company AGMs where directors can cast thousands of votes. So not even sure the shareholders actually appoint the uh, auditors. They call them proxy votes, they can cast them. And then you find uh, uh, people don't actually know anything about the auditor. Nobody's given sight of the audit tender, the audit contract, the composition of the audit team, what time, how much time anybody spends on the audit or consultancy, what the regulatory background of the auditor is. So at BHS, the audit partner just spend two hours on the audit, 31 hours on consultancy. Never mind any norms about anything else. And the audit team was under the control of somebody who only had one year's post-qualification experience. When I started going through the BHS accounts, it wasn't long for the benefit of the parliamentary committee, I concluded that BHS had been bust for years. It was not a going, not a going concern. Uh, and uh, that is how it turned out to be, as the eventual FRC report said. Uh, but all the procedures of the PWC had been internally approved by various other oversight committees that a partner would only spend two hours on the job. Somebody with only one year's post qualification would run the audit team. So there is still absolutely no transparency. We only become aware of audit failures because of the stench of scandals. As long as a company survives by hook or crook, the audit quality issues remain covered and it is business as usual. This industry, audit industry, has been a serious, has been a serial, serially failing industry. It has gone on for decades and decades. It has always managed to avoid reform. So the state has created the audit market, then given it to accountants belonging to a few trade associations. Then the state has enacted barriers to entry, which exists in the EU as well as in the UK. For example, only entities which are under the control of somebody who has a license to carry out an audit can do an audit. What I mean is if a limited company is doing the audit, 51% of its shareholders have to have a license to do an audit. 51% of its partners have to have an audit license. Don't say that about somebody manufacturing aeroplanes or going into pharmacy or food business to say that 51% of your shareholders must be chefs or pharmacists or pilots. Uh, so th this prevents new entrance to the market and inevitably audit firms continue earning monopoly rents. And there is absolutely, uh, there are very few pressures upon them to improve accountability. Christiana mentioned reform of auditor liability. What we learned from BHS, Carillion and many others and Wirecard is Big losers are supply chain creditors, employees, pension schemes, taxpayers, local councils. They have absolutely no say whatsoever in the appointment of auditors. An audit report is not even addressed to them. They don't benefit from audit at all. Earlier it's been mentioned that the audits are for the benefit of investors. No, they are not. In my mind, there's a difference between investors and shareholders. Uh, investors may put, may risk some money. Shareholders are simply exchanging kind of a secondhand securities. In the economic language, that is called fictitious capital. I sell my shares to Andy. Well, we exchange money, uh, lots of money possibly. Not a penny of that goes to the company. And many of these shareholders have a short-term interest. Institutional investors are selling tranches of share every 22 seconds. Now, where exactly is their long-term interest? The only parties which have the long-term interest are other stakeholders, like employees, suppliers, and others. And they don't benefit from it at all. So we really need to think this through 
And I don't think we can continue to allow accounting firms to dominate this market. They have had over a hundred years to get their act together. They still can't deliver on or a robust audit. And uh, simply to say that they will do better next time is simply uh, not on at all. Now, I have come across court cases, just to give you one example. Uh, this, this is a real live case. It's, it's called ILIF News and Media. Uh, it, is, it is a company which was issuing free, free local newspapers, which had lots and lots of advertising. Therefore, it was making a lot of money. And inevitably, employees got someone to read the company accounts and said, hey, we want higher wages. The company didn't want to do that. It also resented paying taxes. So they asked auditors to provide an answer. The auditors were Ernst and Young. They then devised a tax avoidance scheme, which they said would also deflate. This is the auditors telling the company would also deflate uh, the company's profits. So what happened? Uh, well, uh, they advised the companies to sell the mastheads of the newspapers to, a, to another company. So this company acquired them for a one pound nominal sum and then leased them back. So each local newspaper is a subsidiary. So those mastheads are leased back for which then it collects royalties, about 50 million pound. So now the subsidiary accounts profits are depressed by 50 million. The company can say to the employees, we are not making much money, go away. Even worse, the company then went, went to HMRC and said, by the way, uh, we are not going to pay tax on this because uh, this is something separate altogether. HMRC challenged, the case went to the court and the board minutes were produced. What did the board minutes note? That Ernst & Young told the firm that if it followed their plan, the transparency of the financial statements would be impaired. Not improved, but would actually be impaired. The auditors are showing the company how to improve the transparency. And we think these people are going to hold companies to account, management to account, to improve stakeholder welfare, absolutely uh, no chance uh, whatsoever. So I would personally like to see a state body to carry out audits of large companies. In the UK, we are looking at about 7,000 to 7,500 companies in that category. In case you think it is radical, I am sort of going back to the past. In the US, when the Securities Exchange Commission was formed after the Wall Street crash, the 1933 and 34 Act, they had a provision that only the SEC shall do the audits of large listed companies. The first chairman of the SEC was a man called Joseph Kennedy, who was handed that task. He then brought in advisors from Price Waterhouse and Deloitte and the rest, as they say, is history. That bit of the law never, ever got implemented. Now, ask yourself, we live in a world where there is a real time movement of money. What exactly is the point of an ex post audit? Now, we got to a situation where the regulators like the, pretend, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, the PRA, don't even actually believe audited accounts. They, cal they calculate capital adequacy in accordance with their own rules. For example, they ignore all the amounts to do with goodwill in the financial statements of the bank saying this is worthless. They include capitalization of uh, software by saying, well, it's not really worth much. It's something worth to the company, not really to anybody else. So in other words, PRA is not attaching much importance to company accounts, it's calculating its own numbers and they're reaching a conclusion whether a bank insurance company or a pension fund is a going concern. So we now have a scenario. Markets are being given one num set of numbers by which are audited accounts. Markets are being told, believe them. The regulator says, no, 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 no. I don't believe them. I will calculate my own numbers. And the truth is something else altogether. Only, only known to a few inside the particular companies. And then it goes to taxman and it's an entirely different set of affairs. We have a multiplicity of accounts, multiplicity of duplication, a waste. UK has nearly 400,000 professionally qualified accountants, the highest number per capita in the world. We still can't produce a decent set of accounts. 
we still can't tell an asset from a liability, income from an expense. Uh, what a state of affairs. We need deeper reforms, simply tinkering with audits in, a, in the traditional way will not do. But even if we want to retain the, retain the private sector approach, the first thing is we must have an audit only firm. That firm must do absolutely nothing else. It must be completely structurally separate from the rest of the organization. When I put that to the big accounting, accounting firms, they said, oh, that would make it difficult for us to be a part of a global network. That's not true. There are, these firms have 80 plus offices, and I've counted them, there may be even more, 80 plus offices in tax havens, which do absolutely no audit. Yet they are part of a global, global network. Why well, can't audit only be part of a global network? We want to see things like audit tenders published. And the firms say, oh, we can't do that because that would be, uh, that would be divulging confidential information. That is untrue. For example, firms poach partners. Firm A poach partners from firm B. Don't they actually take the knowledge with them? They also poach staff. Don't they take the knowledge with them? It is only that they don't want to show the public at large anything. We've got to break down those barriers. We need to know the composition of the audit team, the audit time budget. We need to see the audit contract. We need to know the regulatory record. Well, so when I was looking at Carillion, it was straight away obvious that KPMG's audit of Carillion, Carillion's goodwill, was utterly faulty. Then going back to the FRC's reports for the three years before the collapse of Carillion, what did FRC flag up? That KPMG's audit of goodwill is faulty for three consecutive years. Now imagine when the auditors were appointed if that was highlighted. Wouldn't people ask questions? Wouldn't they be skeptical about appointing such a firm? Wouldn't that exert pressure upon them uh, to perhaps get their act together? So we need far more transparency. Auditor liability has to be a pressure point. Stakeholders must have a right to sue negligent auditors. Stakeholders must have a right to see auditor files. What is in these files that is so confidential? Is it a position of troop movements, spy satellites? that would endanger national security? Or is it something else? So we need to see all those things. That is a necessary step. Audit, auditors must be appointed by an independent body, at least for large companies. Must, be, uh, yeah, uh, must not sell any other kind of service because there will be audit only. We need a reform of auditor accountability. Accounting and auditing standards can't be set by private entities. At the moment, our accounting standards are set by a body uh, based in Delaware, IFRS Foundation. Why, is it in, uh, why was it ever uh, created in Delaware? Because of secrecy. And also initially to enable it to dodge taxes on its donations from various American uh, corporations. Uh, our auditing standards are set by the IASB. Uh, and where, what do these standards mean? These standards are essentially the residue of negotiations and uh, compromises by a corporate elite that don't necessarily serve any local interest. So parliament should set accounting standards. We only need a one line accounting standard such as Goodwill shall be written off or over a period not exceeding five years. Full stop, end of story. Rather than giving management enormous discretion as we tend to do at the moment. Auditing standards are about auditors' duties. They must be enshrined in law, which means people like you and me can go to court and challenge auditors. When they are simply in private hands, they can't be enforced in law. Judges will say which uh, part of law has been violated. And the litigant says, my Lord, there is no such law. Well, you have absolutely no chance. So that is just for starters. Maybe I will pause there and take any questions, Andy. Thank you very much. Wow, Prem, that was absolutely fantastic. Delivered so clearly and powerfully. I I'm sure everybody else would like to join me in showing our appreciation to Prem. That really was absolutely superb. Thank you so, so much. You've cut through all the all the noise, all the distraction, all the irrelevances, and you've got really to the heart of the matter. Prem, thank you very much. I'm sure there are folks who'd like to respond to what you've said with thoughts and ideas. Uh, would anybody like to go first? 
Wow, I think everybody might be a bit blown away here, Prem. Um, who'd like to go first? Uh, Mr. Ed Tuhig in Nova Scotia. Please uh, share with us your thought. Thank you, Ed. Well, as a chartered accountant, much of my early career was in auditing. And uh, then I got away from that, of course. And I look at it with uh, some concern because I attribute it to a lack of professional pride. When these auditors do poor audits, uh, it shows to me that they do have not the pride of their profession. And part of this, I believe, is in the education system that goes on within the profession, which to me, uh, although it has ended up with many more letters after petitioners' names, uh, has not improved their moral outlook on the world or their profession or anything else. I can't, I have to point out after the discussions, I have a shirt that I acquired some years ago. It's called Arthur Anderson is written on it. One of their internal things that I have kept this for years as a, as a, <laughs> as a thing. So uh, I have great disappointment in my profession and uh, I'm glad that uh, I got out of the audit part of it before it turned quite as bad as it is. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Ed. Uh, thanks for showing us your Arthur Anderson bit of kit. That's a, that's a memento, isn't it? It really is. Um, would anybody else like to make a point? Mr. Chris Toby. Um, Chris, please introduce yourself. You've not been on for a while. So tell everybody who you are, where you are, what you do, and why this topic matters so much to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, my name, my name is Chris Toby, and, and I live in Kentucky in the U.S., and I'm involved mostly on the public pension side of auditing. I've worked for the Kentucky State Auditor, uh, but I do a lot of investment work, too, and I've been hired by the Chicago Police Pension to do a forensic audit right now. And my biggest problem now is, I, you know, I, I don't worry about the public companies. It's all the private equity valuations and real estate valuations, which the auditors admit that the the managers actually make up themselves and the auditors just rubber stamp it. And uh, those are the real problems of the issues I'm having because that's just, you know, valuations of billions that we're talking about from poor auditing and our pension plans in these alternative investments. Much, much worse. I mean, the public issues, they're all the same, but this is even worse because private's even more private. Uh, even uh, more secretive, so much Delaware. It, they're all either in De Delaware or the Cayman Islands, all these partnerships. Uh, and Arthur Anderson and their audits are all, uh, I call them not mark to market, but mark to make believe. Uh, so those are my big issues right now in, in the accounting world. Thank you very much, Chris Toby. And um, before we go to Barry, I'm going to mention something that I first became aware of directly as a result of uh, Prem. Um, Chris Toby, who spoke just now, um, has been battling for years to help get rid of, frankly, I'll be blunt about it, corruption in the pension system in parts of America. And he's been doing that very bravely and very courageously and very tenaciously. And uh, he has my lifetime's respect for the work that he's been doing. The reason I mention this is because a while ago, I had the pleasure of watching Prem speak in, in the Commons. Uh, sorry, in the House of Lords, rather, and he mentioned something called the Sandstorm Report. Now, this is a different topic to what we're talking about tonight, but I want to make a connection to this thing called the Sandstorm Report because I can't escape the concern that the way all the different parts of the political and regulatory machinery is failing and all the ways the trade bodies and the professional associations and the network of the powerful is failing, I can't escape thinking that there's some kind of sleaze going on here. There's some kind of a swamp that needs to be drained. Excuse me for using that phrase. And that is definitely the conclusion I come to, having read the Sandstorm report. Now, Prem may or may not want to speak about this later after our next main speaker, Mark Bishop, speaks. But I do want to take this opportunity having heard Prem speak so directly today, to draw everybody's attention to this thing called the Sandstorm Report, because it is, it is really worth reading. So let me tell you where to go to get this thing called the Sandstorm Report. There's a Wikipedia page. This is the Wikipedia page. Of course, 
I perfectly understand the sentiment. Do not believe everything on Wikipedia. I get that. However, what I'll, I'll put the link up, Andy. I'll put the link up. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And and what you've got in this wonderful Wikipedia page is something which is actually, it's it's actually quite funny. Okay, because the the British government has been trying for years to keep the sandstorm report hushed up. That, that is the honest truth. The evidence shows that. And here I am, this, this, this recording is going to go out on the internet and I'm happy to make the statement, the British government has tried hard to keep the sandstorm report hushed up. And what makes this Wikipedia page almost funny, if it wasn't so serious, it would be funny, okay, is are these two documents here. Full report part one, as you can see, it says, with sections censored by the UK government highlighted with red boxes and full report part two is without that bit. So let me just click on full report one and it takes you to what this document is. So there you've got one version of the document and all those red boxes are the bits that were censored by the British government. Okay, Prem may or may not want to elaborate on this later after uh, Mark Bishop has spoken and full report part two is the um, same document with all the redacted stuff. Now, interestingly, my understanding is this document is freely available in libraries around the USA, but you don't have to go to USA to go to one of their libraries to get it. It's literally there on the internet. And the reason I'm talking about the Sandstorm Report, folks, as Prem may or may not want to speak about later, is because it's all about the collapse of the BCCI. Do you remember that great big bank that fell over? Uh, it's all about the, frankly, the sleaze and the scandal that was wrapped around it. And I am making this point because to my mind, it is the most egregious example of the swamp-like activity that sometimes does happen. And this is basically what we are dealing with here. We are dealing with powerful vested interests with very, very clear agendas that very rarely are anything to do with truth and transparency. Very, very, very rarely anything to do with truth and transparency. And if Prem wishes to, and it's entirely his choice, he may want to talk about the Sandstorm Report as a bit of an appendage to the conversation we're having tonight. But I do urge you to, uh, to, to, go, to go to the documentation we prefer to. I'll park that for now. Prem may or may not want to pick it up later, but what I'm going to do now is go straight to Mr. Barry James. Barry, over to you, sir. Thank you. First of all, Lord Seeker, thank you so much uh, for your work and for that crystal clear presentation. It's so much needed. Um, you said a couple of very, very significant things that I'd like to draw attention to, that this isn't going to get fixed in the current paradigm. Um, I know that that is absolutely correct from my own uh, work, research and experience, working in part with, quotes, the regulator, um, the FCA uh, uh, and the FSA before that. Uh, so, so, so that, but uh, um, let, let, let me just kind of um, say this. Ed earlier on was saying, you know, this is a reflection of a lack of pride in the integrity within the profession. Um, but what were you said? The other thing you said is the man that pays the piper these days calls the tune. Um, and uh, this is, is it not a reflection of the financialization, the extreme financialization of not just audit, which is which should be um, immune to this, of course. That's what it's supposed to be there for, I guess. Um, but it, it, isn't this a, um, a, a symptom of the, uh, the extreme financialization that, that kind of runs across so many different areas? And if so, um, how, you know, what, what, what more should we do about it? Thank you, Barry. Let's go back to Prem with that. Thank you, Prem. Any further thoughts, please? Uh, well, there are a lot, lots of points I want to respond to. Go well, for it. Th thank you very much. Firstly, to Ed's point about lack of professionalism. Well, certainly, uh, you know, when audits have become big business, 
big firms use that as a foot in the door to sell other things because audit is really a stall. It gives them un unrestricted access to senior management to sell consultancy. It is inevitable that uh, uh, what you call professionalism would re has really disappeared. Audit accounting education, I've been involved in it for most of my life. I've seen it deteriorate so much so that actually accounting is no longer really discussed on professional education at all. It is all about what the rules are, what rules you got to learn, rather than what accounting might be about, what it could be about, uh, what the possibilities of good society might be, good life might be, and hence all, you know, sort of about checklists and big firms not really thinking about this. So it's like a Politburo who sit on standard setting bodies, do the thinking, and the plebs are then told, just follow the rules. And that, that is what they do. And very rarely is there any curiosity about uh, why accounting changes, why it fails. If anyone was to look at standard accounting or auditing books today, they will not find much discussion of scandals as though they never really happen. And these things just keep getting bigger and bigger. And we are constantly told that we have accounting rules which are principle based. It is some principle when accounting standards run to three and a half thousand pages. Uh, uh, and indeed, there are no principles. There are unprincipled people in charge. Principles are not really going to constrain them in any way whatsoever. Uh, whatever. Now, Chris's point about uh, uh, private equity and so on. Well, yes, we have now have a real problem. So traditionally, it's been argued that auditor, that shareholders were the risk bearers and they actually need the information. Private equity has turned that completely upside down because private equity essentially load the company up with secured debt, which they themselves hold through offshore entities, and they actually become secured creditors and they are first in the queue uh, when, when those entities go uh, bankrupt. So there is little or no risk uh, to them. There is also the emergence of the option pricing market. Uh, the finance uh, scholars, if they are listening, will be familiar with calls and puts. And the theory suggests that by a judicious combination of calls and puts, you can eliminate the downside risk. So once again, people can be fairly reckless in risk taking because they're taken up all kinds of options to deal with this. But private equity has also many other points. Maybe we can have a discussion uh, uh, another point and uh, another time. So, so we actually have accounting now, which is impenetrable. You look at a set of typical accounts, even want to find out how much tax they paid. It is almost impossible. You're tied up in knots unless you do basic accounting work, it's very, very difficult. Companies don't extract return just through dividends. The shareholders would be paid through things like share buybacks. There are a whole range of intra-group transactions uh, to do with uh, uh, royalty fees, management fees, interest payments by which the parent companies are extracting returns. So nothing is straight, nothing is straightforward. Accounts, most accounts are legally compliant, but actually opaque. And the regulators are not really bothered about it at all in any way. So pretty bad news. We need a complete uh, kind of uh, rehash. Now the point Andy mentioned about Sandstorm, just to give you the background story, uh, I've mentioned it in parliament during a parliamentary debate and challenged the minister face to face and as you can imagine, no response. So the background, just to put it in a bigger context, there was a debate about the financial services bill. And my argument is, uh, well, the current regulators are not up to the job. Government is not up to the job because what the UK government has been doing is protecting criminal organizations. Organizations which actually admit in writing that they've been engaged in criminal conduct. A good example of that is HSBC. Chris would know HSBC got fined $1.9 billion in the US for facilitating money laundering. At the, uh, in 2012, that was the largest ever fine on anybody. And uh, it paid that fine. HSBC was authorized by the UK regulators, then the Financial Services Authority, 
So the question is, why on earth did the UK not investigate the criminal conduct of a bank which it supervised? Now, nothing happened. Roll on, roll on 2016, another US House of Representative committee got curious, wondering why is it that a bank which pleaded guilty to criminal conduct, pay the largest of a fine, has not been prosecuted. It investigated and published a report. That report included a letter from the US Chancellor, UK Chancellor, George Osborne, the governor of the Bank of England and the head of, head of the FSA, various emails and letters, basically saying, please go easy on HSBC. It is too big to jail. And uh, you know we don't really want the markets upset. Now that really poses fundamental questions. What about the rest of us? Uh, what about protecting the rest of us? So the government made those interventions behind the scenes with absolutely no announcement to parliament, nothing, absolutely nothing. Even when the 2016 report is published, no announcement, no acknowledgement, no investigation. Well, I got to parliament and I thought, well, I must ask this question. Why? So when you look at the US House of Representative report, it also goes after Standard Chartered Bank for, again, money laundering and sanctions busting. And it ha had quite a large fine and no action taken. The legal documents also note that Deloitte helped Standard Chartered, possibly to falsify various documents as well to put the regulators off the uh, trail. Again, nothing. In that debate that I mentioned BCCI, so just to refresh your memory, BCCI was closed in July 1991 by the Bank of England upon evidence of fraud. It was the biggest money laundering, banking fraud scandal of the 20th century. To this day, there's been no investigation of that scandal at all in the UK. So in around about year 2000, I got interested in this and with a US scholar, we decided that we would look into various aspects of it. And she, she decided to visit the US Congress library and found the Sandstorm report. There are many reports. They all had a code name. This one was called Sandstorm report. It was never finalized. It was prepared by Price Waterhouse for the Bank of England, and it's been totally suppressed. So in the US, Senator John Kerry's Foreign Affairs Committee decided to investigate uh, this uh, banking uh, fraud. And uh, they then uh, eventually got hold of a version of the Sandstorm report. And that copy ended up in the Congress library. It was redacted. Under our freedom of information laws, I wanted a full copy because I said, well, I did not know how, what was sitting in the US Congress library, how complete it was. So I put in my request to the Treasury. Instead of taking 20 days, it took two years and told me I can't have it because it is not in the public interest. I said, just a minute, it's sitting in the Congress library and I've already seen most of it. I don't know how much is missing. Mm -hmm. They said, I can't have it. I appealed to the Information Commissioner. He said, I can't have it either. He agreed with the government. So I thought, well, it's worth pursuing it through the courts then. So I took on both of them. Altogether, it took me five and a half years in total. Eventually, three judges unanimously ruled in my favor and said this information must be released to me. So the government complied and released it to me personally, but did not put it on any website or in any parliamentary library or made any announcement about it to parliament. So I asked the government in March, this year in a parliamentary debate, when are you going to release it? The reply is it is, not, uh, it is not our policy. So they still think it is secret. So what does the unredacted version show? That the bank was looted by Al Qaeda operatives with the full approval of the British and presumably others too. Al Qaeda operatives at Saudi intelligence, uh, members of the royal family in the Middle East, gun smugglers, murderers, torturers, killers, mercenaries, you name it, they're all there. And the, and the copy that is in the US Congress library excludes the names of all these people. Some of these people had died, yet the government would still not release their names. 
saying, oh, uh, it was to protect the privacy or the privacy of dead people, privacy of convicted criminals, convicted murderers. So my sort of conclusion is there is no way in the UK you can clean up the finance industry, the banking industry. You can really deal with money laundering when the state itself is dedicated to protecting criminal organizations and protecting wrongdoers. It is not feasible. We need to change that state through by mobilizing public opinion. That is what we really uh, need to do. But at the moment, that is not happening. So in parliament, interestingly, some legislators stood up after I spoke and said there are circumstances when governments have to do these things. Well, if there are those circumstances, well, what about our interests as people? Don't we need to be protected from criminal activity? So that really poses fundamental questions about the nature of our democracy, about secrecy and accountability of the government. So did the government promise that it won't protect criminal organizations again? No. Did the government give an, undertag, give an explanation of why it did it? No, nothing forthcoming. So I will continue to push for this at every chance that I'm going to get. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And let's show our appreciation to Prem once again. This is really, really outstanding input. Uh, once again, Prem is speaking truth to power without flinching. Uh, and what I'm gonna do if I may folks, is I'm just gonna share with you uh, one screen because there's a danger that people think that the sorts of issues that Prem is talking about are in some way historic. You know, there were old problems that have been sorted out, you know, legacy issues. Don't worry, it's all sorted. Nothing to look here. I'm going to show you a screen from our Violation Tracker database. Violation Tracker, as many of you know, is a US database that captures information about which organizations have been fined, how much for doing what. And I'm, not, I'm genuinely not picking on HSBC for any particular reason at all, only because it's come up in this conversation. And I think what I'm about to show you is, is very likely to be part of a wide trend. It's very likely to be part of a wide trend. I'm choosing my words carefully because I really don't want to say anything that is not appropriate for me to say. But what I'm about to show you is, I believe, very likely to be part of a wide trend. And this really just speaks to the problem about the idea of us needing some kind of a paradigm shift, some kind of a new, a new era where these sorts of issues can be dealt with. Because uh, if you contrast the two speakers we've had so far, Christiana's speech was excellent and it was essentially about fixing the situation from within the current paradigm. And Prem saying, no, that's actually not gonna work. We need a new paradigm. This takes me back to um, when I was a youngster, I used to sometimes do up cars. And one of the most difficult decisions you'd ever make when you're doing up a car is, you've got a very rusty wing of let's say an, an MGB or whatever it might be. You've got a very, very rusty wing. You know, it's pretty decrepit. You say to yourself, am I gonna patch this thing up with some fiberglass and some filler and a bit of welding here and there? Or is it so shot that actually the only logical intelligent thing to do is to take the wing off and replace it with something entirely new. And that to my mind is um, conceptually kind of where this conversation is. So let me talk about HSBC. So I'm gonna share my screen. I did a very simple search within Violation Tracker because Prem mentioned HSBC earlier. And, and we've got some really interesting data here. It's saying that HSBC has been fined in the US, by the way, stress this point, since the year 2000, 6.512 billion for 63 records, 63 infringements. They relate to financial offenses, competition related offenses, employment related offenses, consumer protection related offenses, and government contracting related offenses, right? Um, etc. Now here's my point. I normally show these tables according to the size of the fine, but no, I'm not doing that. What I've done is I've sorted this on the year the event happened, the year the infringement has been registered. So if we go back to 2012, anti-money laundering deficiencies by HSBC Holdings, etc, etc, etc. DOJ, that's Department of Justice Criminal. Then, then we, oh forgive me, let me go back the wrong way. Uh, so here we got it in, in year order, 2000 for wage and hour violation. That's a uh, wage theft as some people would put it. 
2001 for investor protection violations, more 2001 stuff for fraud. Um, 2002, we've got uh, mortgage abuses. 2002, more mortgage abuses, etc., etc. And it just carries on. The same stuff by the same parent organization, HSBC, all the way through. This is not old legacy stuff, ladies and gentlemen. This goes through to 2021. 2021. So please, please, please do not fall into the trap of thinking that these are issues that have been dealt with historically and it's all done now and it's all sorted. That is not the case. Prem, once again, thank you very much for your session. That was really, really, quite frankly, quite, uh, quite, quite awesome. We'll go to Mark Bishop. Mark's going to come at things from a different perspective. But once again, we're really challenging the, frankly, the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the audit profession to carry on being responsible for doing audits. That's essentially the idea we've got here. What is the case for radical reform of the audit profession? We've heard from Christiana, we're, we've heard from Prem Seeker, we're now going to be hearing from Mr. Mark Bishop. Mark, over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Andy. Uh, the title of today's event is about radical reform of the audit profession, but my presentation is actually about a pragmatic solution. And the reason for that is that I think that the audit profession, and particularly the big four, represents one of the most powerful interest groups in our society. And if you attack this interest group with something that they can present as being radical or extreme, they can other you, they can present you as being somebody on the margins of society whose views aren't practical, aren't achievable, aren't you know, deliverable, and therefore can be ignored. So what I've concentrated in, on doing is to look at the problem in its simplest form and how it might be solved. Uh, because if everything that you propose is unreasonable and they still object, what's left must be unreasonable. So first, I think it's just important to recap a little bit about why this stuff matters, specifically in the context of financial services consumers because as far as Transparency Task Force is concerned, it's their interests that we exist to advance. So the first and probably most important example of why it matters is the scam collective investments, of which there have been so many in recent years. Now, oh, sorry, so I just moved forward by one. Um, and I think it's fair to say that almost without exception, when these scams come to light, it's only a very short period of time before very difficult questions have to be asked about the competence and integrity of the auditors. So London Capital and Finance, Connaught, Blackmore Bond, those are just a few examples of collective investment schemes where the auditors were either asleep or frankly had taken a bung. Um, and I'm not saying they have been taking a bung because I can't prove it at this point, uh, but if they didn't take a bung, then they were incompetent. It's one or the other. And if they don't agree with that, they can sue me. Um, the second example is listed companies. And here are just a few instances, Patisserie Valerie, Carillion, Globo, Quindell, and the so-called filthy 40 Chinese aim frauds. Now, a lot of people I fully accept uh, do not invest directly into individual limited companies and would never do so, it's beyond their risk appetite, but they may not realize that actually their money is entrusted to these companies anyway, because if they're in, for example, a defined contribution pension scheme, it's going to be in the mix of equities, and it's quite possible that some of those equities are ones in which there are problems with audits, to put it politely. Um, that another reason why it matters to everybody is rent extraction. If the fee levels are excessive and the value being delivered for the economic owners of the equity in those companies is poor, then we are all being fleeced indirectly, even if those audits are broadly competent, because we're paying too much. Okay, so next slide, oops, there we are. So I'm going to talk a little bit about legal liability of auditors, and I absolutely stress, I'm not a lawyer. So if anybody disagrees with me on the facts of this, you know, please tell me where I'm wrong, but this is what I understand to be the case. An auditor is liable to the client, and the client, of course, is the company that commissioned the audit, if the work is negligent or dishonest. So in theory, a duff audit, the auditor ought to pay the company. And of course that benefits the shareholders 
in the company, but it's not as simple as that. Firstly, you need to prove that at least one of the directors was not involved. And the reason why this is the case is that if all of the directors were involved in a fraud or in false accounting, then the argument is that the auditor pointing these things out to the company, remember, it's only the company, would not have resulted in a change of its behaviour. And that he or she, that is the honest director, would have been able to prevent the misconduct. So if that director was a, a non-executive, not based in the building on a short-term contract or something of that sort, the, the auditor can still argue that that director would not have been able to stop the fraud and therefore the firm is not liable. And even then, if you can prove those two things, the liability is limited to the losses that could have been prevented. Some of those losses may already have been in train, it may be too late. And even then, you've got to hope that the auditor is good for the money. And I can think of a number of cases where they have not been, and therefore there has not been the opportunity to achieve full redress, even when all these boxes could be ticked. Crucially, there is no liability of auditors to third parties. And examples of the kind of third parties that we as TTF might be interested in are the shareholders, stroke investors, and the clients of a firm. So for example, if there was an investment platform, we're interested in the clients, even though they're not shareholders. So all of this being the case, I have a four step solution that I believe could solve this. Now, the first step, which, you know, it's not radical. If you, if, you, if you look at it as a solution to the problem I've described, it's not radical. Introduce an auditor's duty of care, which would be owed to anybody who loses money through reliance on a negligent or dishonest audit report. That is all that this means. And just in case anybody from our friends at the FCA is listening to this presentation, by definition, a duty of care is subject to a private right of action. If there's no private right of action, it's not a duty of care. This is not a matter where the FRC can say, these are our rules and we will enforce them, but then they choose not to enforce. This must be a situation where the victims can go to court and seek redress. The next step, and again, this is fundamentally rational and, and reasonable, it's not a radical ask, is to require auditors to be insured against this risk. Now, the minute that you agree that principle, you have really unlocked the solution to this problem, in my view, because the cost of that insurance will be path dependent. It will be dependent on the behavior of that auditor in the recent past. I will talk a little bit more about this soon. The next step, and again, you'll see why uh, it's important that there is, has to be this insurance, is to introduce periodic mandatory tendering for audit work and even further to require clients to require clients to accept the lowest bid provided insurance is in place. Now you've seen that, you can probably see why the path dependency is so important because auditors that are dishonest or incompetent will find that they can't get insurance. Brilliant auditors will find insurance is very cheap. And if you combine that with mandatory price-based tendering, you will require firms to use the firms that are competent or the, 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 the auditors that are competent because they are the auditors that are able to get cheap insurance. And finally, and again, it's rational and there's no reason why this shouldn't be done, introduce a ban on non-audit work. There are two reasons for this. The first reason is at its most innocent, the acceptance of non-audit work effectively creates no-go areas in an audit. An auditor cannot independently and rationally analyze, for example, you know, a revenue recognition policy or a depreciation policy or a tax mitigation plan that it recommended and created for the firm it's auditing. Clearly they're conflicted. If you look at it in a less innocent one, sometimes this non-audit work is a bung. You know, will you accept my controversial policy on, I don't know what, you know, the valuation of, of stock that we have at the end of the year? Well, it depends how much non-audit work I'm going to get, doesn't it? 
So you have to eliminate those sorts of incentives. So let's have a little look at what this means, sorry, for how the firm may operate. The key point is that uh, instead of having a situation at the moment where an auditor may be chosen by a firm's management, because that auditor suits the firm's management, in the future, firms will be choosing on price. And the price will largely be a reflection of insurance premium. And that will be largely a reflection of track records. Firms with bad histories would be priced out of all but the easiest jobs. Of course, the partners in that firm might be able to help get the premiums down by offering up some personal guarantees, economic alignment of interests. And actually, if they're prepared to do that, that may indicate that any past misbehavior or poor standards are behind them. Individual auditors with bad histories would become unemployable. This is a crucial factor. I think anybody who studied audit in any detail knows that there are individuals who are a problem and those individuals do hang around for a very long time. They don't exit the industry in the way that one might expect. At the same time, there'll be another change, which is good challenges will flourish. You know, we talk about the audit industry as though it's incompetent. In fact, actually, according to the FRC, only about a third of audits of large firms are flawed. Two thirds of the work is OK. And if you come outside of those large firms, I would suggest that that percentage might even go up. But the problem we have is that for whatever reason, the medium sized and small firms find it very difficult to become larger. And in the situations I've outlined here, that would happen. And there may be an element of social justice, justice to this as well, because auditors' incomes, particularly those of the big four, would drop probably quite dramatically. You know, the days of audit partners on 900k, a million pounds a year share of profit, that would be behind us. Uh, and there are two reasons. The first reason is that they would be having to buy this insurance. And initially, at least, this insurance might be quite expensive. The second reason is that requiring price-based uh, competition for audit uh, instructions will cause fees to fall as well. So what we'll get is some kind of normalization of the rates of income of people in that profession. But the, probably the most important thing is that consumers, citizens will be compensated when things go wrong, but crucially, things will go wrong only rarely because for the first time, economic incentives will be aligned and made functional. Okay, so next slide. I must apologize, slight problems getting the slides to move on. Um, so there are a number of challenges with this, and I think the first and biggest one is that auditors really don't like it up on. You know, if I were an auditor, particularly if I were the big, in one of the big four firms, why would I support these proposals? Of course I wouldn't. If I were a really capable challenger, I might well support these proposals, but I don't have much of a voice. I certainly don't have, have the ear of people in government or the treasury. So these people, the incumbents, how might they argue against the kind of proposals that I'm putting forward? I think the first thing they'll do is they'll say that there isn't any kind of insurance market to insure these third party uh, claims. And of course, technically, they're right. There isn't at the moment because nobody chooses voluntarily to cover that risk. But if you require there to be audits, it's a state mandated obligation on all but the smallest firms. And if you require there to be substantial insurance in place, you know, effectively what you've created is, is complete pre price elasticity. People have to buy, the firms have to buy this insurance. So there will be insurance, there will be insurance, there has to be, it's basic economics. Um, it will be costly, yes, initially, um, but it will come down and it will come down most for those who have integrity and are competent. So these things will change. The connected nature of that industry, I think would make it very difficult uh, to get these uh, modest proposals accepted, but I think that it's worth fighting for them. Uh, I think the case is actually pretty compelling. The first one is that right now, there are huge negative externalities as a result of bad audit being borne by the little guys, by us in society. That's unjust. But the second thing is economic interests currently are very significantly misaligned and these proposals would change that. Thirdly, the solution I'm proposing does not require there to be, you know, huge commissions, you know, huge changes in audit policies, you know, any, you know, big thing, intervention from the state. 
it doesn't require any of those things. It's decentralized and it's market based. So anybody under a conservative government, you know, anybody who says we don't want this kind of thing, all you do is you say to them, it's a market based solution. It's the most market based solution you can possibly imagine, far more so than the situation that happens at the moment. Therefore, as I said at the very beginning, I don't think that there are legitimate grounds for rejecting these kinds of reforms. And therefore, what's left is essentially illegitimate. OK, so that's me done. Uh, has anybody got any questions? Mark, that was absolutely superb. What well thought through set of ideas here. Outstandingly, outstandingly insightful set of ideas. Um, Wonderful. We're going to go straight to Mr. Martin White, who I think is going to talk about the challenges on the insurance front. Mr. Martin White, what say you, sir? Um, yeah, I, I did put some comments in about the challenges in the insurance front. Um, and I, I, I can tell you it's going to be tricky because the key thing for insurance companies, if they're intelligent, is not to go bust themselves by offering cover which has a catastrophic potential. So they've got to limit their total losses, their total exposure. And I can see that being rather tricky in terms of pricing. I completely get the point that having insurers price in, if you like, quality and integrity and process, et cetera, would be very good indeed. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering a little bit, in a way, this is our whole, whole discussion today. We've talked about the wider problems of which audit are just a part, the context, which is important. Um, and we've been talking about some pretty big changes that we'd like to see in audit. But, uh, and I don't disapprove of those, but I, I think um, uh, my practical suggestion would just be one thing only, one thing only to start with. And unfortunately, wretched British government has not put it in its um, paper, even though it was talked about earlier, which is simply make sure that the audit auditors do not regard the company as the client. Um, it's totally vital that um, somebody other than the management of the company decides who the auditor should be and that the auditor should owe their duty to them. There was, I think, a good, a good suggestion, it was a radical one, in one of the reports that have been done for the UK government that suggested that regulators should be responsible for deciding who gets which audit. I know the regulators themselves don't like responsibility, but you could get all sorts of parties involved in it. But the critical thing uh, is that the auditor needs to regard delivering the truth and outing misbehavior as the thing that gets the well done in the junior and senior staff, rather than gets the, they gets the quiet pushed to one side. Um, and um, I, 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 that, that's, that's, that comment has been made by people I know who have been in, in senior positions in audit firms. The reality is that the brief that or the, the proposal that, that, come, that auditors put forward tends to be all about how well we work with management. Well, that's not what we want, is it? Yeah. No. So there you go. That's my point. Martin, thank you very much indeed for you sharing your thoughts. While you were speaking, Martin, I was thinking about what if... Mark's ideas were actually introduced and what if the pushback was to say there's so much risk in the insurance idea that we aren't just going to support this we'll never let this happen we'd rather go you know protesting in the streets and campaigning against these kind of reforms what if there was a massive reaction and what about this then what about the compromise position how about something like this might be a stupid idea but I'll mention it anyway what about saying okay as of the 1st of January 2025, I'm just choosing 2025, it could be any year, but a future point in time, this is going to be the new paradigm. You must have insurance to operate as an auditor. And if you don't have insurance, you won't be able to operate as an auditor. That's going to give you a few years to run up at this problem, get your house in order and make yourselves insurable. I don't know if that idea has got any merit at all, this kind of take a run up at it kind of approach. Mark, I think you re responded to that. Mark, please share your thoughts on that particular point and then we'll open up wider to everybody else. Thank you, Mark. Yes, uh, Andy, I'd just like to really uh, respond to what you said and also to what Martin said before. Uh, you know, when I was giving that presentation, you probably got the feeling that I understood that in the early days of this rule, 
premiums, insurance premiums would be quite high. And they would be quite high for two reasons. The first reason is it would be difficult to quantify the liability. And the second reason is the audit profession is a, is a cesspit, you know, and frankly, they'll get it wrong quite often. Um, and, and I think the solution is exactly the one that you've described. It's, it's actually a very modest solution because what it does is it gives the industry an opportunity, firstly, to fix itself, and secondly, to demonstrate what the level of those claims could and should be. It might actually need to be quite a long period of time. It might need to be five or 10 years, I think. Um, in fact, I have offer an analogy, actually. Um, those of you who follow news about COVID will notice that on Monday, we had a supposed Freedom Day and opening up. And on the same day, the Prime Minister announced that in two months time, end of September, uh, there would be a change to the rules so that people cannot get into nightclubs unless they are double vaccinated. Now, I bet you that that rule never comes into effect, but I also bet you that it was introduced as a nudge policy so that a load of young people, many of whom haven't been vaccinated, go and get themselves jabbed. Mm. Uh, something similar happened in Israel, where they were ahead of us with vaccination. They said they were going to have vaccine passports if you want to get to restaurants, bars, all the rest of it. Uh, in the end, most of those places didn't bother asking for them and they were never compulsory. So I could see here that in a way, what matters is not that you require people to have the insurance so much as that you require that there is liability and you make people think there's going to be insurance. Now, you probably do actually need the insurance as well, because otherwise you'll get some firms that just pretend to be competent, but actually are incompetent. And then you don't want the public having to pick up the losses. You socialise them uh, in the way that is happening at the moment. Um, but I do agree that a long lead time would give the opportunity for the industry to improve itself. I think what might happen actually is uh, a load of people would be spending a lot more time on a golf course, particularly in the big four. Uh, and I think there would need to be an understanding between the some of the big companies and auditors about what standards might be expected in the future. Mark, thank you very much. Let's open it right up. I'm not going to go to Martin White, even though I can see his hand, because Martin's got one of the Just a Minute rounds later, and Martin, Martin can squeeze what he wants to say into that. Thank you very much, sir. Please wave something at me if you'd like to say something. Mr. Dennis Cox, lovely to see you at one of our events, sir. Please uh, fire away with your point. Thank you. Yeah, let's, uh, on the insurance point, um, I don't want people to go away thinking there is an insurance because we've had an obligation for PI cover inside the profession. It's a member-based requirement, and that's been in place, I think it's for 35 years. So I you know, don't think there isn't PI cover. The problem has been that the smaller firms can't get the cover. Going back exactly to the point that Mark was making, in terms of the requirement in terms of the information you are required to provide to the insurer, it does include the risk management strategy, claims, his, history, regulatory background, and all that stuff. And that has to be provided to the insurance grouping now. So that's already in place. What's happened this year is that we've lost a load of capacity. At Lloyds of London, where all this stuff is ending up, they're not pricing this anymore. So we've actually got a lot of firms who can't now get their insurance, in which case they're not then allowed to do the audits. So they're actually excluded from the market. So I didn't want you to go around and think we didn't have this already. Now, it is on the person, not the firm. Recognise that's the way it sits at the present. And you might have a view that maybe it should be twitched around. And I can certainly understand and, 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 and verify that. But I don't think that that's going to make a lot of difference. I'm, 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 I understand the point you're making. And I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's going to help us that much. I am very worried though about the idea of trying to say that they're forced to go to the lowest price audit because I remember those days. And uh, you know, some of us remember the firm Half Price Waterhouse and, uh, it, that, and uh, I was on the other side of that. And that I would think um, I would create more problems than before. So the, the, what I'm looking for is, uh, is, is a hybrid essentially, which is that there should be a government body which is doing the oversight of the individual audits paid for from the public purse. And we actually get that into that kind of a position so that we actually can get someone who is independent, truly independent, checking the quality of the reporting before it goes out. Not joint audits, I've done those, they're a nightmare, things fall down the cracks. Don't like that one, I've had to work with those ones. But I am worried about the lack of independence. I am worried about the lack of oversight. And I think that is, is the approach that I would be tending to push for. Because without that, I think we're wasting our time. We're just moving 
uh, deck chairs around. The quality is not there. And that's what you know, Prem has been saying and then the other speakers. Um, somehow we have to ensure that it is there. Otherwise, the firms shouldn't be issuing those damn reports on which we are seeking to rely. So that's, that's the position that I'm really taking it from. Mr Dennis Cox, thank you very much indeed for articulating your position so clearly and frankly in a very uh, compelling way. I, I, I dig a lot of what you're saying. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, who else would like to go next? OK, in which case um, we're going to go back to Mark Bishop, who's got his hand up. I can just about see it. Yes, go for it, Mark. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. I'd just like to respond to the two points that Dennis made. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, for the, for the avoidance of doubt, I wasn't suggesting that any auditors don't have any insurance at the moment. Of course, they all have insurance for the risk that they're taking, which essentially is a liability to the firm. Uh, the problem at the moment is they don't have insurance for a new liability, which might be to the people who relied on the audit, the duty of, duty of care. Um, and, and that's the thing that I think needs to exist at some point. And I absolutely accept to Martin's point that we need a transition to get there, which may have to be quite long. Um, I think the other point is about lowest price. Uh, again, I, I fully agree. I understand there was a period of time when price only was the expectation um, on which a contract would be let. And, you know, unsurprisingly, that led to poor quality work. Uh, and that's not something I would propose. Um, what I'm proposing is that the requirement to have insurance for, for a duty of care uh, would create a situation in which the really bad firms would leave the market. And actually, even perhaps better than that, more refined proposal than that, that firms would be able to win the type of work for which they were suitably qualified. So a firm that's reasonably competent would be able to win pitches for fairly straightforward work. Ones that are extremely advanced and adept would be able to win contracts for the really complex and contentious stuff. So I do think that there would be uh, a solution there which is different than simply uh, being based on price because in the background, the price would be a factor of, you know, time costs and insurance premiums. Um, so I think that there is a way forward there. I, I understand what you're saying, and I think that Prem has talked about some of the things in the past about whether there should be some kind of public body that is responsible for, you know, the quality of, of audits. And, and I guess, you know, that's better than a, a self-regulated industry. I think self-regulated industries are dangerous. But equally, you know, here at you know, Transparency Task Force, most of the stuff that we do looks at financial services regulation, where there is, in theory, a third party government created statutory regulator, but it's useless. You know, I don't think there is anybody who is close to the FCA um, in terms of having studied it from a consumer perspective that thinks that organisation is anything other than, you know, a putrid web of conflicts of interest, you know, and you can see what would happen. If we went to the Treasury and said, you know, we've got to get rid of the FRC, we should have a statutory body that monitors the performance of audit firms, they would say, great, let's get Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, etc., to put together a paper on how it might work. And guess who will end up staffing it? You know, you know exactly what will happen. It would end up being sticking plaster. So I would love that if you could absolutely guarantee that it was staffed by people who have consumer interests. Funnily enough, in financial services, you could go a long way towards it, you know, and we've put, put, put forward proposals a bit like that, how the FCA could be overseen by consumer interests. But I think the difficulty with audit is your average consumer isn't capable of con conducting an audit. It is quite a difficult thing to do. So, um, so that's why I kind of I feel nervous about it, partly because it's difficult to sell to people and also because I think it would be captured just like anything else. Mark, thank you very much indeed. In, in a moment, we're going to go to Martin White for his Just a Minute round. Then we're going to go to Chris Toby for his Just a Minute round. Then we're going to go back to Lord Prem Seeker for any further reflections from, from Prem before I start bringing things to close in probably about five, ten minutes or so from now. So first of all, can we please show our appreciation to Mark for once again, yet another very, very insightful session. Thank you, and everyone. Your, your, your creativity and analytical brain continues to amaze me, Mark. It really does. Great to have you as a significant part of the team here at TTF. Really, really great. Mr. Martin White, you're just a minute round. Now, for those of you that aren't Radio 4 fans like what I am. Um, the Just a Minute round was inspired by BBC Radio 4. 
there's a there's a program a comedy program speakers get to speak for just a minute without re yes. repetition deviation or hesitation now we're not going to challenge martin to speak without repetition deviation or hesitation but we are going to challenge him to only speak for one minute go for it sir thank you okay Andy, i think i might even manage less than that um words like cesspit um i think in practice people like to be good um and their behavior is governed by the the pressures that are around them and the structures in which they do business so if an audit firm has to compete with how well they please the management you you have a corrupt system and i think this is a point that Prem was making right at the beginning. There's a real problem with audit and it's built in. Um, the same thing, it, that same principle, you can apply to a lot of things and it tells you why regulation fails. Um, in companies, what gets the well done? What gets the well done is reporting profits. So what you try and do, you fiddle the profits, etc. Or high rate of return on capital, you fiddle the account, you, you fiddle the capital structure to, to uh, gear it, etc. So it's not just a simple matter of saying do this better i think we should think very carefully about the way in which the structure forces people to behave martin thank you very much you make me think about that charlie munger quote i'm quoting probably at least once a week show me the incentives and i'll show you the outcome that's exactly. the that's the context in which all this happens people are perhaps being incentivized to do the wrong stuff and they'll carry on doing the wrong stuff yeah. if they're being and, 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 and the true incentives aren't necessarily quite what people think at first sight they are thank you thank yeah. you martin thank, thank you, very you. Much indeed. we go from martin in the uk to mr chris toby all the way on the other side of the pond chris uh, your time please for your just a minute round go for it oh i just want to say appreciate everybody's talks on this again we're using this in the US talking about this as like a fiduciary duty, a duty of care. We're calling it, that's the wording we're using a lot. And I know Andy, we've been talking a lot with people on that. And we do have a mechanism, we have one mechanism that works uh, in the US and it is called uh, ERISA is our law that creates a fiduciary duty for pension plan providers. And we have been able to sue you know, the interests aligned up and and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, Andy's had Jerry Schlichter on who's kind of format, you know, done this in the US and led this from a legal thing that the attorneys get one third the damages. So they have an incentive to, to actually get in the game and help, um, you know, go after wrongdoers inside of pensions. Right now, you know, it's mostly investment managers are the ones making the most money, but auditors could be included in these ERISA suits as well, except that they're just not paid as enough uh, usually paid enough that they are, uh, you know, high on the list of uh, collecting for damages. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. But I think that type of arrangement in the U.S. where we've had a uh, the, put into law a fiduciary duty and then gave attorneys the incentives to, to, to uh, you know, act on it has been the, by far the most successful thing uh, that, that has ever been done in, in providing transparency. And that's that's just kind of my, my take on things. Uh, Chris, thank you so much. And I think what you just said ties up very well with step number one in Mark's four step plan, introducing a duty of care, a, a legally enforceable responsibility. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chris. Great to have you with us. And I'm going to repeat myself. I think the work that you've been doing in the in the United States to battle for transparency in the pension sector has been really outstanding. And we at the TTF continue to salute the work that you do. Thank you, Chris. We're going to go to uh, Lord Prem Zika for any final thoughts he has before I start bringing the session to a close. And I, I know I'm a bit, bit biased, but it's been such an incredibly thought provoking and uh, learning rich session tonight. Really appreciate every all the input from all the speakers and everybody that's contributed. Uh, Prem, over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Andy. And it's really been a great uh, workshop. <clears throat> I learned a lot from all the presenters and the speakers. Lots of things to ponder on and reflect on. <clears throat> Just some issues about what Mark uh, presented, excellent ideas, but we still need someone to come up with accounting standards, i.e. accounting rules. 
And my argument is you can't delegate them to the private sector because they will use it for their own benefits. That gives management too much discretion. Chris was earlier referring to mark to market. Sometimes I call it mark to myth. Uh, companies can just generate any numbers they like, and that is what they were certainly doing at Carillion because it suits their bonus profile, performance-related pay profile. So you still need accounting rules. My preference is they be part of legislation and then the regulators can fill in the details, all the principles, like I said, right goodwill off over a period not exceeding five years, end of story, uh, that that goes in there. We still need uh, auditors' duties. They should not really be given to the private sector. That is a matter for prior the parliament. Put it, put it another way, all accounting auditing matters have an effect on things like wages, taxes, dividends, uh, perceptions of risk, credit rating, and all these things have a redistributive effect. And in democratic societies, only parliament has a public mandate to redistribute income and wealth and be accountable to the people, not private organizations like the International Accounting Standards Board or the FRC or AGA or anybody else. So therefore it is a gross violation of parliamentary democracy that these organizations are allowed to set these rules. Now, the other thing which Mark uh, perhaps meant, did not get enough time, so if I applied the BHS and Carillion lens to his proposals, next question is, what is there that would prevent uh, the auditors from having an audit team of novices? My argument is we publicly need to know what the composition of the audit team is, what the audit time budget is, what the contract is. In other words, the mere fact that we might get to know the PwC had planned only two, budgeted for only two hours of the audit partner's time in audit of BHS. If that plan was published, there would have been, you can imagine, all sorts of you know, criticism. That itself would have persuaded them not to do. So in the proposals which Mark was referring to, maybe we need to add an extra dimension that is transparency and public accountability of the audit process itself. Uh, otherwise, I thought they were really excellent points. So I will pause there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Prem. Wonderful input tonight. Really rich, wonderful input tonight. I'm going to share my screen once more because I want to let you know what you can look forward to because this is the last event we're running until the summer holiday. I'm very, very proud of my little team at the TTF. They work very, very hard. Uh, I don't know how many events we've run so far this year, but we've run quite a few. Let me just take you on this journey that we've been on this year so far. And then there's a couple of events in September I really do want you to look forward to and get yourselves booked on for. Um, so uh, we started off in January with uh, the film club, The Big Short. We then had loads of events in January and then February. I think we're running more events than some of the big, big organizations and we're doing this all on a shoestring. We desperately, desperately need more subscription members. Please, please, please. We're going broke. We can't survive all the rest of it. I won't kind of dwell on the point, but we really do need everybody to become a subscription member. And remember, the, there's the, the subscription membership arrangement is structured in such a way that everybody can afford it. There's no like mandatory minimum. So this is what I want to focus on. On the uh, 14th of September, we have an event called the government's response to the work and pensions vet committee's report on pension scams and why we should, sorry, and what we should do about it. So that's going to be a good event. The day after, Wednesday, September the 15th, we've got a very, very provocative event. Why our financial regulatory framework is failing and what should be done about it. And then on Thursday, September the 16th, we've got an event entitled the FCA's Transformation Programme and Beyond. And the speaker for that is the chief executive of the FCA, uh, who's agreed to a Q&A piece afterwards. I think it's great that we've managed to uh, get the chief executive of the FCA to come and talk to the TTF about the Transformation Programme. And it's also great that he's agreed to respond to some questions. So... Don't miss that one. It's going to be a bit of a one-off opportunity to put questions to him. 
We're going to have a lot more questions that we're going to have time for. So the process is very, very simple. Let me have your question. We'll go through a process of deciding the best, strongest questions, and then we'll put those questions to him. That's the plan of attack. And that, I repeat, is Thursday, September the 16th. So we're going to wrap it up there, folks. I've really enjoyed tonight's session. Uh, I've learned a lot from Christiana and Mark and Prem and all the other contributions we've made. Let's give ourselves a pat on the back, not just for tonight, but for having gone on the journey we've gone on all year long. We've worked very, very hard together. We've looked at all kinds of stuff. We've shone a big bright light, exactly where the bright, bright light needs to be shone. And we can continue to do it with a sense of enthusiasm and honor and integrity. I personally think our cause, our collective cause, is both noble and necessary. And I'm as convinced about that today as I was on the 6th of May 2015 when all this stuff kicked off. So thank you all very, very much indeed. Let's celebrate our, our collective effort and let's celebrate our opportunity to work with each other as time goes by into the future. Thank you very much. Enjoy your summer holidays, folks. See you in September. Thank you. Thanks, bye -bye. Andy. Thanks everybody. Bye all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.